Military murder is an independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for coming back for your weekly dose of true crime. Welcome to Military Murder. Before I begin, I just want to ask you all for one favor. If you like this show, please make sure you're sharing it with your friends. You would be surprised how many closeted true crime lovers are actually out there. All right, on to our story. In the military, the dichotomy between non-commissioned officers and young enlisted members can be hard to navigate. As a superior, you want to be likable, but you also need to get the mission accomplished. And sometimes that means being stern with your non-performers. In the military, you can't just fire people who aren't good at their job. If it's just a performance issue, you have to train them to be better. But sometimes being stern can lead to resentment, and resentment can lead to murder. Today, I am going to take you through the investigation of a very tragic murder of a newlywed couple. The husband, a Marine sergeant, and the wife, an aspiring doctor. Their life was snuffed out just 68 days after their wedding. They never even got a chance to see their wedding pictures. But who wanted this young, vibrant, full-of-life couple dead? Was this a hate crime because this was a young, biracial couple? Or was the murder motivated by greed? Join me as I discuss the life and death of Janek Pawal Pichik and Kiana Jenkins Pichik. Now, let's dig in. I first heard about this story when I watched the CBS News special called NCIS, The Cases They Can't Forget, Unbreakable. This CBS special really informed the meat of this story, but I also relied on the information I found in the Court of Appeals opinion, KTLA 5 News, The Press Enterprise, New York Daily News, Riverside Press Enterprise, and ThePatch.com. Our story begins with 24-year-old Marine Sergeant Janek, which I'll call Jan, Powell Pietrzak. His name is Polish for John Paul. He was born in Poland and his parents emigrated to the U.S. in 1994 and they settled in Brooklyn, New York. He was only 10 years old. Then 9-11 happened and Jan told his mom he was joining the military because it was his duty to fight for his country. And in 2003, he joined the Marines. By 2005, he deployed to Iraq and upon his return home in 2006, he proposed to the love of his life, 26-year-old Kiana Jenkins of California. Jan was a helicopter mechanic stationed at Marine Corps Air Station Miramar in San Diego, California. Prior to his assignment at Miramar, he was stationed an hour north of Miramar at Camp Pendleton. Kiana was an aspiring doctor and she worked at the Black Infant Care Program. She was counseling and teaching young soon-to-be mothers. Jan and Kiana married on August 8, 2008, 8808. And she told her mother that she picked this particular date because it would make it easy for her husband to remember their anniversary. Jan had recently re enlisted in the Marines, and with this re enlistment came a very nice $30,000 bonus. And he was high on life. During the CBS special, which aired in June of 2019, I learned that Jan was proud of this reenlistment and more so not the money, but the commitment that he was making to his country. And he actually told various people that he knew that he kept a big chunk of cash in his house, which is never a really good idea. Well, in June of 2008, a few months before they got married, the young couple, they purchased this beautiful standalone house in French Valley. And I saw a picture of it and it was really a lovely house three-car garage, lots of room for a growing family, and it was secured with a home security system. But this security system would not stop a monster from cutting Jan and Kiana's marriage short. On Tuesday, October 14th, 2008, Kiana spoke to her mother around 8 p.m. So she's walking around the house, chit-chatting with her mom. Kiana sets the alarm on the house and then the conversation ends soon thereafter. 
Around 9.47 p.m., Kiana's mother sends a text message saying goodnight, but she doesn't receive a response. The following day, on Wednesday, October 15th, 2008, after Jan and Kiana fail to go to work, the Riverside Sheriff's Department, they conduct a welfare check and they go to the house that's located at 31319 Bermuda Avenue. That is when Riverside County Sheriff's Deputy Matthew Hughes made the gruesome discovery. The front door was ajar, and when he looked inside, the contents of a purse lay in the entryway. He knew not to go any further. He called for backup. As reported by the New York Daily News, homicide investigator Benjamin Ramirez said that Kiana was found nude, leaning against the couch with red duct tape covering her eyes and her mouth. She had been shot twice in the head. The attacker spray painted the letter C on her stomach. Jan was found leaning against Kiana. His face, wrists, and ankles were bound. He had been badly beaten. He had been stomped so hard, in fact, that he had shoe imprints on his body. His face was covered in blood and he had been shot in the head three times. According to the Court of Appeals opinion, a fragment of a bullet was lodged in Jan's head. Near the victims, they found two couch cushions that appeared to have been used as a gun silencer. And of the scene, there was obviously something missing. Shell casings and fingerprints, they were nowhere to be found. It appeared that the intruder had flipped the house upside down looking for something. Things were laid all over the floor. Dresser drawers were left open. Clothes was half hanging out of the drawers. Open alcohol bottles were on the living room floor near where Jan and Kiana were found. It was discovered that jewelry had been stolen from the house. And this included the wedding bands, Kiana's engagement ring, Jan's Movado watch, a pearl necklace, an earring and bracelet set, as well as Kiana's ATM cards. So clearly, there's a lot of valuable things that are missing. You're thinking, okay, someone came here to steal valuable things. The perpetrator of this heinous crime tried to start various little fires around the house to get rid of the evidence, but it was unsuccessful. And the house like never blew up in flames or anything like that. Detective Ramirez said that there were two racial slurs written on a wall near the bedroom and the bathroom, which to them pointed to the possibility that the crime could have been racially motivated. And this is appropriate for me to say at this point that the Pichicks, they're a biracial couple. Jan, as I mentioned earlier, was Polish American, light skin with piercing blue eyes. Kiana, she was a petite, beautiful black woman with caramel skin, dark brown eyes and a big smile. But who could commit such a gruesome murder? Did Jan have any enemies? Did Kiana have any enemies? It would take the work of both the Riverside Sheriff's Department and the Naval Criminal Investigators, NCIS, to crack this case. In the CBS special, there's two NCIS agents that tell the story of how this case was solved. And those two agents who speak are Agent Matthew Timmons and Agent Heidi Schumacher, or Schumacher. During the investigation, the investigators immediately get a lead. When they discover that Kiana's ATM card was used at 3.20 in the morning in Fallbrook, California, and this is within hours of the murder. The ATM machine was located a half mile from the back gate of Marine Base Camp Pendleton, and the perpetrator had the ATM pin code. So while the investigators are waiting for this ATM surveillance video to come back, Investigators immediately thought there was more than one perpetrator involved, specifically because they identified at least three distinct shoe imprints at the scene. And so shoe print science is very precise, so much so that the experts, they're able to pinpoint the brand of the shoes, at least for two of the three prints that they found. And these are Nike Air Force Ones and Nike Cortez. And so after reviewing the crime scene pictures, NCIS starts to get this feeling, right? They get this feeling that the perpetrator or perpetrators were Marines, or if they weren't Marines, they were at least military. Because when they're looking at the crime scene, there are many valuable military things that were left untouched at the crime scene. NCIS's thoughts confirm what civilian investigators already thought. This was the work of multiple Marines. Upon receiving the ATM video surveillance, it's grainy. 
they see what appears to be a man. So he's like walking towards the ATM card with his hand over his face and this blue bandana. So there's no way you can even see who this person is, but or they do think that the stature is like that of a man. What they do notice is that the glove that the guy is wearing is a black glove and it has the word mechanics on it. And it's like multiple times, like a brand where they put the brand name multiple times over the glove. Once the perpetrator arrives at the ATM card, he stops covering his face and covers the camera with his hand. And so at this point, investigators, they have something, right? They have a blue bandana, a black mechanics glove, three sets of shoe prints, racial slurs on the walls at the crime scene, and a possible connection to Camp Pendleton. Because remember, that's a Marine base. So NCIS knew that Jan was recently assigned to Camp Pendleton. So they pulled a roster of all the people who worked with Jan and they conduct interviews. Someone was bound to know something. According to Jan's friend, Matt Ferrara, Jan had told him that he was having issues with some of his younger Marines being insubordinate. And as a supervising Marine, Jan was tough on his young guys because he wanted to hold them accountable. The military is big on accountability, but you know, with good reason, not just because they want to be jerks because people live and die on military orders. Of course, at the crux of any investigation is trying to find someone with a motive to kill. So NCIS was trying to find who had a motive to kill Jan. And that's when Sergeant Nathaniel Weisel, a coworker and friend of Jan's, immediately had someone in mind. Boom, Lance Corporal Tyrone Miller. I'd like to welcome our newest sponsor, Ritual. Vitamins, do you take them? Well, just like that deadbeat you married straight out of tech school, vitamin labels can be disappointing. The labels claim one thing, but the fine print is like, just kidding, these vitamins don't really do that. Hard pass. Enter Ritual, made for skeptics by skeptics. With their multivitamin for women, what you see is what you get. And what you get is good. I've always been into taking vitamins, especially a multivitamin. But I hate the awful taste or smell or aftertaste that many multivitamins give off. Well, with Ritual, this is a non-issue. I just finished up my first bottle of Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus Multivitamin. And the first thing, the very first thing I noticed when I first started using it was its minty taste. This is by far the best tasting vitamin I have taken in my life. And I've been taking multivitamins on a daily basis since I was in my mid-20s. But it's not just about the taste, it's about what you're putting into your body. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is one of the few women's multis that's USP verified, meaning what's on the label is what's in the formula. It's also soy-free, gluten-free, vegan-friendly, and formulated without GMOs. And with nine key nutrients and two capsules per day, including magnesium, vitamin A, vitamin E, and vitamin D3, just to name a few, you know exactly what you're putting into your body instead of just taking whatever you got at the pharmacy and hoping for the best. Which, listen, I will admit I was guilty of doing that for over a decade. But with Ritual, there is no more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during their first three months. Visit ritual.com slash military10 to start Ritual or add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash military10. Ladies, if you're sitting there, I want you to stop what you're doing and consider your bra. How comfortable is it? Is it poking and prodding you, but you hardly notice anymore because you got used to wearing a bad bra? Well, stop that. I recently discovered Third Love. Shout out to Third Love for sponsoring this episode and their bras are phenomenal. Every lady has a bra type, push up, underwire, wire free, and I'm a wire free girl. These tatas hate wires, but I'm happy to announce that Third Love's bras don't do that. They have the ever popular 24 seven t-shirt bra, which you should definitely check out. But my all time favorite Third Love bra is the Form 360 Fit Wireless Bra, yes, It's truly the perfect bra. The material is super smooth with a smooth band and it forms to your body. It provides a lift without being too exaggerating and it stays put all day. I will admit that I have a hard time finding a bra that fits right, but when I do, I usually buy it in several colors. 
And that's what I did with the Form 360. My favorite color is the dandelion color. I guess it's because my favorite color is yellow. Shopping online for bras may seem scary, but with Third Love's online fitting room, you will find the perfect fit size in no time. But guess what? If there are any issues whatsoever when you get your bra, simply return it or exchange it using Third Love's free 60-day return policy. 60 days? That's more than most places. So listen up. Ditch your bad bras. Get a better one that makes you look and feel great. Upgrade your bra today and get 20% off your first order today at thirdlove.com slash military mama. That's military M-A-M-A. All right. 20% off your first order today at thirdlove.com slash military mama. Jan was Lance Corporal Miller's supervisor when he was stationed at Camp Pendleton. And Weisel had heard two things through the rumor mill. And the military rumor mill can be crazy. One, Miller didn't like Jan. And in fact, after the murder, someone overheard Miller say, quote, it's a shame about Kiana being murdered, but I don't care about Jan, end quote. And two, the day before Jan and Kiana's funeral, Miller had been shot outside a movie theater, not too far from Jan and Kiana's house, in an alleged drive-by shooting incident. Over the span of various interviews, NCIS keeps hearing the same name over and over again, Miller this, Miller that, Miller this. In fact, they even heard that Miller might have been affiliated with a gang. So NCIS is like, all right, we have to talk to Miller. They discover that Miller was married and had two young kids, and he lived on base at Camp Pendleton. On Tuesday, October 28th, almost two weeks after the brutal murders, investigators brought Miller in for questioning. And when asked what he knew about Sergeant P and his wife's murder, Miller said, well, I Googled it, so everything I learned about the murders was what I learned on Google. Miller agreed that he and Jan had disagreements at work over stupid things, but Miller knew that Jan was just trying to help him out, trying to make him better at his job, and ultimately holding him accountable for his actions. And according to Miller, on the night of the murders, I was definitely home, is what he said. Miller does say that about a month before the murders, he did visit Jan at his house, and that was the first time that he met Kiana. But besides that time, he hadn't been there again. So detectives press him about his whereabouts on the night of the murder. Did you leave your house for any reason? And Miller kind of goes from, nope, I definitely wasn't home, to, uh, I don't I don't think I left the house that night. I don't, you know, now, I, I didn't leave. No, not that I know of. So detectives are like, all right, we know this game. So they have to change tactics. And they ask, all right, do you know how cell records work? Why would your cell phone records show that you were in an area near Jan's house? And remember, Jan lived off base, miles away from Camp Pendleton. So if Miller was in fact at home, there would be no reason for his cell phone to ring anywhere but at or near Camp Pendleton. So Miller hesitated and he began to think, well, maybe, uh, maybe I wasn't, maybe I wasn't home. You know, in fact, the only reason I ever go out there near Jan's house is if I'm riding with my friend. And as he's thinking all of these things out loud, He says the last time that he rode with his friends was about two weeks ago. Bingo. Two weeks ago coincided with the brutal murders, but the investigators didn't let on that they were excited about this response. All right, so about two weeks ago, you were riding out with your friends. What do you and your friends typically wear when you go out? And so I just want to say something. Now, this question is so relevant to military members because Typically, military members are in uniform. They all tend to look similar. Same uniform, clean cut, no facial hair, etc. But when military members are out of uniform, sometimes they don't even look like they're in the military. Their styles vary greatly. Some people, they wear facial piercings. Some people have long hair that you would never even realize that they had. And if you want to see a real transformation, see military members when they're at work and then on the weekends when they're off duty because many times it is night and day. So Miller doesn't think anything of this question. This question doesn't seem odd to him at all. So he's like, oh, cool. We wear hoodies, baggy shirts, and blue bandanas. All right, what kind of shoes do you guys wear? 
Well, we wear Jordans, Chucks, and Air Force Ones. The hair on the back of the investigator's neck stood up. They had probable cause at this point to do a search. Miller kind of looked like the guy in the ATM video. At least, you know, his silhouette. Okay, so we got that. He named the shoes that left imprints at the crime scene. He independently mentioned the blue bandana, which was seen in the ATM video. And he says that he was likely in the area of the crime when it was committed. But detectives are slick. Just as they were in the Timothy Hennis case, which I discussed in episode three, they let Miller go on his merry way. And as described in the CBS special, hours later, the police, they show up to his house with a warrant, but they knew that this guy might be dangerous, so they came prepared. As the team was approaching the house with their guns drawn, someone looked out the window. The police announced their presence. Police, open the door, and upon no answer, they push their way in. They immediately see Miller's wife in shock. Then they see Miller. Miller picks up his young daughter and shields himself with her as he's walking back towards the bedroom. At this point, the police are sweating bullets. They had never seen such a cowardly move, and they don't want to hurt this little girl. Their hearts are pounding. The police are able to de-escalate the situation. And Miller finally put the child down and is taken into custody. Miller's house was a landmine of evidence. In plain sight, the police found Kiana's ATM card. They also found the missing jewelry, a baggie with four shell casings, tons of blue bandanas, one of which had Jan's blood on it. They find those mechanic gloves as seen in the ATM surveillance video. They have Kiana's blood on them. They find matching sneakers from the shoe prints at the scene. And in Miller's closet on a hanger, they find Jan's marine dress uniform with his medals and his name tape intact. This was the same uniform that Jan wore on his wedding day only two and a half months earlier. And sadly, due to its disappearance at the time of his funeral, he wasn't able to be buried in it. Once he was taken into custody, Miller finally realized he was a suspect, but he was completely baffled on the reason why. I mean, mind you, he wasn't sitting around at the time of the search, so he didn't realize that police had found all of this incriminating evidence. But I swear, sometimes these criminals amaze me. Like, what? It was on the table. Her ID card was on the table. How? What? Did you not think they were going to find it? Like, what's wrong with you? And so he doesn't think anything of it. And Miller waves his right to an attorney and denies any involvement in the crime. In fact, he told investigators something to the effect of, cool, I'm not involved. And if you search my house, you're not going to find anything in there that's Jan or Kiana's. Really? After an hour of playing games with detectives, the detectives say, okay, why was Kiana's ATM card at your house? Busted. Miller talks. Okay, okay. But of course, he minimized his role. His initial explanation went something like this. We went there to commit a robbery, but things got out of hand. We took the ATM card, the jewelry, and I beat Jan up. I also wrote those racial things on the walls because I wanted it to look like it was a racial crime, but it wasn't a racial crime. I just did that to throw you guys off, but I did not shoot them. Miller then provides two names of two other Marines who were there. 18-year-old Lance Corporal Emerus John and 20-year-old Private Kevin Cox. Jan was Miller and John's supervisor when he worked at Camp Pendleton. And Cox, although he worked in the same squadron, he was in a different chain of command. So Jan oversaw Miller and John, not Cox. In addition to naming these two Marines, he names 18-year-old Emerus John as the shooter, and he adds John was ruthless and he didn't hesitate to shoot. Detectives, they, in their investigation, they discover a fourth Marine who was also involved, and this is 21-year-old Private Keyshawn Sykes, and he goes by the name Psycho, which is a good nickname, and you'll see why later. Sykes is in a different squadron completely, and of the four suspects, three of them lived on base, and Sykes lives off base in a town called Fallbrook. Sykes lived with his girlfriend and with Cox's girlfriend, whose name is Melissa Buck. 
So Miller was interviewed both before and after he was arrested. And the additional three Marines are interviewed after Miller. And they all deny any involvement. John, who's the alleged shooter, he even tells detectives, quote, to murder a senior Marine that just got married? I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty sick, end quote. After an initial denial, Cox finally admitted being there, but he denied pulling the trigger. And so Sykes said he was outside when the shots were fired. So, of course, no one. So there's four people there and none of them are taking responsibility for the shooting. However, at the end of everything, Miller, Cox and Sykes, they all point the finger to John as the Marine that pulled the trigger on Jan and Kiana. After searching all of their homes, each one of them had evidence that placed them at the scene of the murder. So none of them could say they weren't there. In the dorms, they found Kiana's engagement ring and Jan's digital camera. And Cox's girlfriend admitted that Cox told her that he was involved in the murders. And the alleged shooter, John, he had Jan's blood on his shoes. And each of their shoe prints matched the prints left behind at the scene. So there is just overwhelming evidence here. At the end, they all admitted their involvement. And ultimately, John, who is the youngest Marine, he's only 18 years old. He admitted that he was the shooter. And I just want to add, thank goodness for shoe print experts. Because remember, back in episode two, shoe prints were partially how Colonel Williams of the Canadian Royal Air Force got busted. He left his shoe prints at both murder scenes. And so investigators when you have a group of four people, you're never going to get a matching story. So they can never get a matching story from the four culprits. But this is the story that ultimately emerged at trial. And this is as reported on that CBS News special, which I highly encourage everyone to go see. And I actually am going to link it in my show notes because I think it, it's a really it's it's a really good documentary and it has lots of pictures and you'll hear from lots of the people in this story. And so the story is, Miller was the mastermind and he's the first one to be interviewed. The foursome, they show up at Jan's house after midnight on October 15th, 2008. Everyone is wearing their blue bandanas to disguise themselves, except Cox. They attempt to get entry through the back, but everything was locked. And they finally decide that Cox would ring the doorbell and they were sure that Jan, a senior Marine, is gonna open the door for a fellow Marine And remember, Cox isn't in his squadron and they don't really have any beef. So there isn't any reason for Jan to be, you know, to be suspicious. So Jan heard the doorbell and he emerges from the second floor in a T-shirt and boxers. But he's a Marine, right? So he grabs a knife before deactivating his alarm system and opening the door. Jan, upon opening the door, is immediately ambushed with the barrel of a gun in his chest and pummeled to the floor. They gag him, hogtie him, and tie his hands, legs, and feet so that he can't get away. They then go upstairs. They immobilize Kiana in the bedroom. They cut off her nightgown. They put red tape across her eyes and her mouth, and they bring her downstairs to be with her husband. Then for 90 minutes, they terrorize this couple while they ransack the house looking for money and other items that they can sell. They load up John's Jeep Cherokee with everything that they can find. But then they're kind of upset because they're looking for cash and they find that there isn't any cash in the house. But they do get Kiana's ATM card and they get her pin number. So I just want to give a trigger warning. So skip ahead a few minutes or a minute or two minutes because the scene does get pretty graphic and especially sexual assault graphic. So here goes. While they ransacked the house, the perpetrators, they found a vibrator. And as Jan watched helplessly in horror, Miller and Sykes took turns raping Kiana with the vibrator. And let me just say what all my listeners are probably already thinking. These men are the most despicable men on this planet. When the men were done with their reign of terror, Miller told John, quote, and them. End quote. That is when John put two bullets in Kiana and three bullets into Jan. They then picked up the shell casings, four of the five, because remember, there was that one shell casing that was stuck in Jan's head. 
They were all charged with two counts of first-degree murder, burglary, and other crimes. Miller and Sykes were charged with sexual assault with an object, and John was charged as the shooter. I want to explain something real quick. Yes, John was charged as the shooter, but at the end of the day, the law doesn't care who pulled the trigger. They were all in on it. In law, if you try to kill someone and you're unsuccessful and are convicted of attempted murder, the possible sentence is the same as if you had committed the murder because the law doesn't excuse your failure to succeed. Additionally, if you and a group of fools decide to commit a crime and one of your co-conspirators kills someone while you're committing a different crime, even if you were just the watchman outside, you could be charged and convicted just as if you had pulled the trigger yourself. So common sense rule, I don't even have to make this a true crime army rule because this is just straight common sense. Don't commit murder and definitely don't commit crimes with other people because group crimes are a team effort and you will win together and lose together. Take that to the bank. Do you ever get sick of how many times you're scrambling to figure out dinner plans? I mean, dinner is every night. How can someone be so unprepared for a daily task? I'm super guilty of this sometimes. Well, fret no more, because with HelloFresh, you never have to worry about what's for dinner, because HelloFresh will deliver farm-fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes directly to your doorstep. March is National Nutrition Month, and HelloFresh makes it easy to choose delicious, dietitian approved meals. Simply look for the dietitian win tag on their menu choices for meals under 700 calories and with only one third the sodium in other meals. This month, the dietitian win menu includes pecan crusted chicken, one pan spiced turkey lettuce wrap, creamy Dijon dill chicken, and Southwest stuffed green peppers. I recently tried the Southwest stuffed green peppers and they are delicious. And while this meal appeals hardcore and hard to make, The recipe was super easy to follow. It took roughly 30 minutes to make the entire meal, so I call that a win. HelloFresh is truly life-changing. No more worrying about mealtime. Visit HelloFresh.com slash MilitaryMama60. That's MilitaryMama and the number 60. And use my code MilitaryMama60 for 60% off plus free shipping. Visit HelloFresh.com slash MilitaryMama60 and use my code MilitaryMama60 for 60% off plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. On January 22, 2009, District Attorney Pacheco made this a capital murder case. In addition to the brutal death that the Pichicks experienced at the hands of four fellow Marines, The investigation revealed that these four Marines were living double lives. By day Marines, by nightfall, ruthless criminals. After they took off their uniforms, they were committing home invasions, burglaries, I mean, you name it. About a month before the double murder, in fact, three of the four men, in concert with two others, they committed a home invasion in Oceanside, California. This group felt that a drug dealer had duped them, They broke into his house and repeatedly beat the male, just as they had done to Jan. They found the woman asleep in her bed and they groped her while she was in bed and then they took her to be in the living room with the man. The intruders were armed and one of the men, they put a couch cushion over the man's head and held the gun to the pillow. The man, though, was able to slap the pillow away, look the gunman in the eyes and said something to the effect of, If you're going to kill me, you're going to have to look me in the eyes while you do it. The woman, which is, she's freaking brave as hell, she slaps the gun away from the man's head and the group, they decide against killing that night, I guess, but they did make away with $1,500 cash, a laptop, Xbox, video games, and jewelry. And all of these items were discovered from the Marines during the initial search. So Cox's girlfriend admitted to being a part of that Oceanside heist. And she further testified that the morning of the Peachick's murder, the four men returned to the house between two and four in the morning, reeking of gunpowder. And they were joking that John had, quote, earned his stripes that day, end quote. According to the New York Daily News, as Cox's girlfriend testified at trial, 
some of the suspects appeared to be smiling. And the sad part is that Jan's mother saw those smiles and she was horrified by how cold hearted they all were. Jan's mother would later say that she was looking for some shred of remorse, but ultimately she said, quote, I didn't see anything, nothing. They're still laughing and cracking jokes. They're not human to me, end quote. And remember that rumor about Miller being shot in a drive-by shooting the night before the funeral? Well, according to the appellate court decision, on October 23rd, 2008, Miller, John, and a different Marine, they were driving around looking to commit a burglary. So, I mean, they freaking kill somebody a few days earlier, and now they're still looking to continue their reign of terror. The Marine in the back of the car had placed the gun on the seat next to him. According to testimony, Miller was driving and made a sudden stop, and the gun accidentally discharged, hitting Miller in the right butt cheek. When the police showed up to the hospital the following day, the Marine who was in the back seat he disclosed information that he had heard from Miller, information that only a perpetrator would know. As my true crime army probably already knows and has learned from our love of true crime shows, during an investigation and initial reporting in the news, police aren't going to give away all of the details of the crime because they hold back to avoid false confessions. And this Marine, he knew crucial facts, facts that had not been released to the media, something you can't just find on a Google search. It should be noted, it wasn't possible that that Marine who was in the back seat was involved in the double murder because at the time of the double murder, he was in jail on a different offense. Prosecutor Daniel De Limon told CBS that this was the, quote, most complex and complicated death penalty case I think we tried in this county, end quote. As reported by the New York Daily News, it was revealed that a few hours before the killing, John posted on MySpace, quote, chilling, waiting for the killing, end quote. Isn't that amazing? Why would he write that? At trial, Miller was the only one to testify on his own behalf, and he testified that murder was never the motive. Earlier the day before the murders, he had been told that he would soon be promoted to corporal. But Jan quickly approached him and told him he would do everything in his power to squash that promotion. The following morning after midnight, Miller went to confront Jan, but things quickly got out of hand. For me personally, this doesn't make any sense and these, and these cases never do. Again, I go back to what I discuss during episode five during the Cooper Jackson case. In that case, Cooper had impersonated an NCIS agent and kidnapped a Marine. So those are pretty serious crimes, felonies in fact, but he committed murder in order to not get busted for impersonation and kidnapping. I mean, that doesn't make sense. In Cooper's case, he was committing a felony to hide a fel felony, but it still doesn't make sense. In the present case, we have a guy who is not going to make rank and not making rank is not a crime. It's a reflection that maybe you need to work harder. And I'm sure all of my military listeners will debate that statement, but debate what you want. I think we can all agree that not making rank is not a reason to take a life and then spend the rest of your life in jail. I mean, can you tell that I'm passionate about this topic? Not about the rank topic, but about the committing murder to cover something else up. I mean, it just seems ridiculous. Prosecutor De Limon argued, however, that there was no evidence that Jan was actually out to get Miller and thwart his promotion. And so that part is a little bit confusing because Miller testifies that the day before the murders, Jan had confronted him about this. But from my reading, I thought that Jan was no longer stationed at Camp Pendleton and was at Miramar. But all of the reporting was very confusing. And that's why I, I'm not sure exactly where Jan was. I, from, from what I read, I believe Jan was at Miramar, but it's possible that maybe he was visiting Camp Pendleton or something. I don't know. Initially, the intent was to prosecute all four defendants together. They were going to have one trial for four guys. However, on February 1st, 2011, they were having a hearing. And during this hearing, as reported by the Riverside Press Enterprise, 23-year-old Sykes, who goes by cycle, stood up in open court and began peeing in the middle of the floor. Quote, 
using his hands to fling drops of urine, end quote. What an embarrassment, right? The judge stopped the proceedings, of course, and ordered a psychiatric evaluation for Sykes. And just my own thoughts here, have you ever stopped to wonder the tales that these judges could tell? And I think uh, I think they're already coming out with a show and I can't remember what station it's on, but I think that would make for some really good TV. I know judges can't talk about what happened behind the scenes, but there are so many outrageous things that happen in open court every day. I mean, it could easily be a decades long series. So after this outrageous act in open court, the court then decides they're going to split the case into two. Cox, Miller and John were tried together in 2013, and that was almost five years after the murders. And although they had one trial for three people, they had two separate juries. And I had never heard of that before. So Miller and John got a jury and Cox got his own jury, although there was only one trial. After a four-month trial and three days of deliberation, all three of these guys were found guilty. And at sentencing, Jan and Kiana's mothers gave heart-wrenching impact statements. And I found a YouTube video of portions of their statements both in and out of court. And warning, I am going to post these. And if you watch it, you're going to be in tears. I mean, I was crying my eyes out watching the agony of these two poor women. And so Jan's mother said, quote, I will never receive another Mother's Day card. I will never hear, I love you, mom. No more conversations with my son, no more hugs, no vacations together. I will never know what kind of father my son would be, end quote. Outside the courtroom, Kiana's mother said, quote, I have nothing left. There is no joy. There is no happiness. We don't celebrate holidays anymore, end quote. Cox maintained his innocence throughout the trial, claiming that he was extremely intoxicated the night of the murders. And when he got to the house, he thought they were there to confront a drug dealer, just as they had done a month earlier. In fact, when everything was going on inside the house, he claimed he was outside oblivious to what was even happening. During sentencing, Cox apologized for what happened to the victim's families, but he maintained he didn't feel that he did anything wrong. He was sentenced to two life sentences without parole, and Miller and John were sentenced to death. When the judge read Miller's sentence, he said Miller was a, quote, man without a semblance of morality or conscience, end quote. After the sentence, jurors were outside the courtroom crying and hugging the victim's mothers. One of the John Miller jurors said, Spending months listening to all the details and seeing all of those pictures, those, that really affected the jurors. And one of the jury members in Cox's trial said that the images haunted them and that they keep seeing them. That's how crazy those images were. She also said that when they were deliberating about Cox's sentence, there were a lot of jurors that fought for the death penalty. But ultimately, they agreed that there was less evidence that he was directly involved in the worst aspect of the crime, which, of course, is the actual murder and the rape. So they settled on life without parole. It is reported that Sykes had his own trial because there wasn't enough room in the courtroom. But really, I personally think it was because they didn't know what Sykes would do in open court, especially after his public peeing ordeal years earlier. And, you know, they didn't want to risk the likelihood of a mistrial or a hung jury or anything else, really. But that's my personal opinion. In 2014, Sykes was found guilty and sentenced to death. Sadly, it wasn't until after all four trials that Jan's mother finally got her son's Marine dress uniform back. She was devastated that she couldn't bury him in it and even more devastated that the last time she saw her son was at his wedding and he was wearing that exact uniform. Jan and Kiana were buried together because their mothers felt that, you know, they were going to be together on earth. So they wanted them to be together in heaven. According to Jan's good friend, they had a full military ceremony, 21 gun salute and all.
For those of you wondering the state of the death penalty in California, as reported by every news outlet, as of March 2019, there were 737 death row inmates in California. And the reason why March was such a big deal was because Governor Gavin Newsom signed a sweeping order putting an executive moratorium on California's death penalty. So as long as he's the governor, everyone on California's death row is safe. And the gist of Governor Newsom's argument is that, quote, capital murder is inherently unfair and is applied more often to people of color and those with mental disabilities, end quote. And I'm going to link the NPR article I read on this issue if you want more on that topic. As I was getting ready to wrap up my online research on this case, I did one last Google search on Sykes. And do you know what I found? I found a website called loveaprisoner.com. And it's a place for civilians to find prison pen pals. The premise of the website is 90% of people in prison will one day walk among us again. And studies show that recidivism is reduced when inmates have support of family and friends. And recidivism is the rate at which convicts commit crimes after they're released from jail. So Keyshawn Sykes is on this website looking for interaction. Maybe he's looking for love. Maybe he's looking for compassion. I don't know what he's looking for. And I found his letter to prospective friends. And it's interesting mostly because he paints himself as a Marine. And he even signs his letter with Semper, which means always. And although not complete, is a partial closing for Marines, which typically Marines will use Semper Fi or Semper Fidelis, which is a Latin saying meaning always faithful. And in this letter, he says he's a kleptomaniac, but he's taking some medicine for that. And he's asking for friends to support him mentally. He talks about needing someone to brighten his day and he'll do his best to make you smile. He says he's a former Marine with three years under his belt, but his dreams have been halted. Boo, boo. Of his hobbies, the one I found most intriguing was, quote, learning how to enjoy every breath of life, end quote. He further says, quote, despite what the state of California would have you believe, I don't bite, I tickle. Signed, Semper, Sean, end quote. I wonder if he's gotten any hits. And if so, do those pen pals actually know what he did? Did they do a quick Google search to see what happened? Because honestly, this story is terrifying. There was a part of this case that I only touched upon briefly, and it was the possibility that this crime was racially motivated. The convicted murderers in this case were all young black Marines, and Jan and Kiana were a biracial couple. The newlyweds' parents have always maintained that this was a racially motivated crime, but the prosecutor's office and the detectives, they always denied that, and they said the Marines were motivated by greed. What do you guys believe? Do you think this crime was racially motivated? I want to talk about one more thing. In order to get the death penalty, the prosecutor, they had to submit special circumstances, right? It's not just murder. It has to be murder plus to seek the death penalty. In this case, the special circumstances were committing a murder during the commission of a robbery, a burglary, and a sexual assault with a foreign object. But the prosecutors could have taken a different strategy and argued that the murder was committed as a hate crime because that is murder plus, right? Do you think that the prosecutors chose the easy route to guarantee the death penalty? And if so, do you think that that was wrong? I don't know. Which is why I pose the question to you. So let me know your thoughts on social. Uh, this is a really interesting topic. I know death penalty is really hot. And I have another death penalty case for you guys next week. And it's, it's another fascinating story. If you find the stories I bring each week thought provoking and you want to continue to hear more, I'd appreciate for you to take a minute to subscribe for free to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform. And while you're at it, give the show a five star rating and a written review if you like the show. This goes a long way to helping other people find the show. Follow on social on Instagram at Military Murder Podcast, on Twitter at Military Murder, and on Facebook at Military True Crime. For a complete list of my sources for this episode, please visit my website at MilitaryMurderPodcast.com. This is a one-woman show, guys, created and produced by me, Margot. All of the music was created by Tyops. 
Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of, not even your coworkers. So remain vigilant always. You have a fantastic week, and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. Shh, let's work another podcast.